how menopause affects the brain. So today's program is for those women going through the fun part called menopause. <laughs> <laughs> Have you ever noticed how hormonal changes of menopause affect your mental functioning? When I started going through the menopause, I started noticing my energy was down, my focus was affected, and I felt really bad. Do we really have to suffer? Can't we do something to improve? Yes, we can. And that is what we are going to learn today. So if you would like to learn some practical steps you can take to improve your brain functioning despite all the hormonal shift that, then stay tuned and give us some thumbs up. Thank you friends for joining us today. I'm sure you're going to learn a lot from our wonderful guest today, Dr. Christine Northrup. Dr. Northrup is a visionary pioneer in women's health. She is a board certified OBGYN with more than 30 years of clinical experience, former assistant clinical professor of OBGYN at the University of Vermont College of Medicine, and three times New York Times bestselling author of Women's Bodies, Women's Wisdom, The Wisdom of Menopause, and Goddesses Never Age. Thank you, Dr. Northrup, for joining us today. It is my pleasure, my pleasure. Thank you. And uh, if this is the first time you are joining us, my name is Dr. Rosina Lakhani, and I'm a board certified psychiatrist helping people with stress, anxiety, and depression for over the last 20 years. I'm also the best selling author and a transformative speaker. I started this program, Happy and Healthy Mind, with Dr. Rosina because I truly believe that a lot of suffering can be prevented with simple mind training. Over here, we share practical prevention for your mental fitness, so you don't have to suffer unnecessarily. As these programs are for educational purposes and not designed for treatment, I encourage you to talk to your healthcare professional for any treatment advice. You can get all the resources shared in these programs by texting us the word JOYFUL to the number 38470 or visit us at happyandhealthymind.com. The purpose of this program is to bring health and happiness to a million people. So if you find any value in these programs, like, subscribe, and share so more people can be helped to live happier and healthier life. So let's dig in. So Dr. Northrup, tell me, why is it important for women uh, when they're going through menopause, especially to take steps so that not only they can preserve, but they can improve their mental health and well-being? The reason why this is so important is that what you do around the perimenopausal transition, which is a six to 13 year process, unless you have a hysterectomy or uh, you have chemotherapy or something of that nature. But during this process, you're literally setting the stage for the second half of your life. And you know, because of what we, the statistics we learn in medical school is that chronic degenerative disease can begin after the menopause. But what I want women to know is the setup for that started sometimes in childhood. You know, we have the famous Bogalusa heart study that showed that eight year olds had the beginning of fatty streaks. So what happens, okay, what happens is that childhood, like cardiovascular disease begins in childhood, bone mass, getting peak bone mass so that you don't get osteoporosis later begins in childhood and the teenage years. So the perimenopause is a kind of a turning point. It is, uh, I call it this, you reach a bifurcation, it's grow or die. So if you keep doing the same things you've been doing, let, let, I'll give you an example of what women like me did. And that is in your thirties, you want to lose five pounds to get into the little black dress for the weekend or the wedding, and you can easily diet and lose the weight. Well, around about 42, 43, the perimenopause, the body goes, really? You're going to do this to me again? I have been cooperating with you and your binge purge and your wine that you're drinking. And I've done that now for 40 years and I'm done. So if you keep doing what you've been doing, I will no longer cooperate. So what women are taught is it's your hormones and you're a victim of your hormones. It is not true because there are many women who go through perimenopause and menopause and don't even notice it. Now that's not common because our culture 
really, really, really believes that something is wrong with women's hormones and therefore you need medication or you need whatever. But you know, because this is what you teach, that health begins with how you think about things. It begins in the mind. It begins with what you've been taught. So I would say, what was your mother's menopause like? What did you learn? I've had women who've said to me, oh, my mother told me that the best years of my life were after menopause, that she felt completely free. She no longer had to worry about pregnancy. And you find that those women who had the mothers who went through beautifully, that's their template that they go, oh, well, this is no big deal. And then the others who say, oh, my life was over and I never should have had you children because you prevented me from having the career that I wanted. And you know, now it's too late for me. If you had that as your template, then you have more work to do to understand that that does not need to be your destiny. Just because that was the mother's story. That was the many times, and you know this, the the traumas, the beliefs are transgenerational, intergenerational. There is a wonderful book called It Didn't Start With You. And it's how the wounds of our ancestors are carried down and actually even imprint our DNA. But the most weak, powerless position you can get into is, well, it's my genes. There's nothing I can do. And we know from epigenetics, which is the environment in which the DNA gets expressed, we know that that's where your power is. So never say, oh, this is what happened to my mother. So this is my destiny. It's not true. Yeah. So we can, we have some power, we can change something. So yes. can you share an example of a, a typical woman that you help and what kind of problems they go through if they don't apply the things that you're going to teach us today? Well, one of the biggest, and uh, my story was archetypal in this regard, but I've heard from so many other women, and that is that the perimenopause puts your relationships under a microscope, and you have to see which are sustainable. So when we're talking about a job or a spousal relationship or one with your children, if there are things that need to be updated, they will come and hit you between the eyeballs because of the hormones, estrogen, which is high relative to progesterone. If you've stopped ovulating, progesterone lands on the GABA receptors in your brain, the same place as Valium, and it's very calming. But if you're skipping ovulations, you don't have that calming phase. And so you can get really, really riled up. And then in the face of stress hormones, epinephrine and cortisol, that excess estrogen actually gets metabolized into another stress hormone called catechol estrogen. So the women are ready to tear their hair out. So what you can do about that. So, is, so before we go into that, can you share the example of this woman that we were talking about? Yeah. That typically so they come in. Yeah. So the, the woman comes in not sleeping. Okay. Yeah. Not losing weight. Mm hmm <laughs> having lost all interest in sex uh -huh. yeah, uh, and having hot flashes. Very, 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 very common. Yeah. And it begins then, and she has the, she comes in with the belief, uh, this is so depressing. I have no interest in sex. I'm afraid that my husband's going to divorce me. All I want to do is go into a cave for a couple of years. I'm so tired of the demands of my children. Uh, you know, they want me to do everything. And here's what here's what what I can say to a woman like that. And here's what helps: is you say to her, "This menopausal transition is adolescence in reverse. Your hormones are actually doing exactly what they did when you were 11, 12, 13." And if you ever talk to an 11 year old girl, and I did this last night, they will come out and tell you the time of day, they know who they are, they're very vocal, and then the estrogen veil falls and we need to fit in as women in society, find a mate, raise our children, get a job, whatever. Well, then what's happening on the other end is that soul voice is coming up. It, it says really, 
what about me? What about my life? So anything you've been putting on the back burner comes to the fore. So one of these women was brought in by her husband mm -hmm. and he was a blue collar worker, a plumber, I think. And he came in in his suit, you know, Bob here on his uh, lapel. And he goes, now listen, she used to be a really good wife. She'd fold the towels, she did the cooking, she did all that. But now she complains that she wants to go back to college. Will you please fix her? Fix so her. here's the thing, there's no need to fix her. What Bob has to learn is that her soul desires to express herself are coming to the fore and she must heed these because if she doesn't and if she keeps pushing them back down then something else is going to happen because our illnesses our suffering tends to be biosymbolic meaning it's symbolic of what needs to happen for us so in this case i talked to both of them and i told him that nothing was wrong with her ex and except that she was afraid afraid to tell him what she really needed. So this is one of the main things for a woman to actually identify her needs. This is revolutionary because when we went over this together, I, I said, okay, what every emotion, and we know this from the uh, uh, Nonviolent Communication Institute, the Center for Nonviolent communication. Every emotion signifies a need. And the so-called negative emotions are the ones that really get our attention. So anger or anger generally means that you don't believe that you can get your need met. And there's a part of you that's just angry about it. Can't you? And then we have that childhood thing you're not doing it for me. You need to, if you, here's one that's very common in women saying to their husbands, you should know what I need. You should intuit <laughs> what I need. And men can't do that. Right, they don't understand. Not do that. So, Other women are pretty good at it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that's really, really um, uh, important point, you know, and, and it happens time and time again. It's really common. So what, after you worked with this woman, how did the, uh, how did her life change? How oh, it completely, she applied to college. All right. She got accepted uh -huh. and her family began, became proud of her. Hmm. They were seeing her and this is so important for women to know. So once she identified a genuine need and articulated it, spoke it outward. And despite feeling guilty, oh, you know, I really should be cooking these home cooked meals for my children. And oh, I really can't be away. All of the things that we do as women. Once she identified the need and got support from her family, which she did, then it was very easy for us to work with the symptoms. The symptoms are relatively easy. So for hot flashes, there's a thing called a chillo. Believe it or not, it is a pillow. You put water into it. I found it was one of the best things that I'd ever, and you can get them on Amazon or anywhere. So a chillo, because you know, you're always looking for the cold side of the pillow. Um, then there are herbal remedies that you can use for hot flashes. Prairie Amorifica is one of the main ones, but there's also Chase Berry or Vitex. And of course, the gold standard is always estrogen. But I like to avoid estrogen as a first line because it is associated with increased risk of breast cancer and uterine cancer and so on. I don't think the risk is... is um, terribly great, by the way, and there are many studies going either way. But the main thing is not to suffer, not to suffer. Um, for sleep, once the hot flashes are cooled, then you can tend to, then you're not nearly so depressed. A lot of women are depressed because they're not sleeping. Mm -hmm. 
And sleep is by far the most effective way to metabolize stress hormones. It's just the most effective way. So whenever- And, and for have, sleep, uh, for depression, you know, in our field, like, you know, sleep is one of the major cause of worsening of all the mood symptoms. Yes, that's absolutely right. Then the, uh, the other thing that I taught her, and because she was fulfilled now, because she could feel the fulfillment, she didn't need to drink so much wine and eat so much sugar. Mm -hmm. And red wine and chocolate are associated with an increase in hot flashes. Mm -hmm. Now, what women can do on this is they decide, okay, tonight I'm having my red wine with dinner. And I know I'll pay for it with a couple hours of hot flashes, but it's worth it for me. So that's okay. That's, so it's that's, your choice and intentional rather than not. You got it. And I'm a victim. I'm a victim. So once you know what triggers the hot flashes, and of course, any um, anxiety or anger will trigger a hot flash. So, but if you're sleeping and if you are eating properly and so on, and mostly if that soul need is fulfilled, you know, one of the things that I did during this perimenal, perimenopausal transition, when I was also going through a divorce is I learned Argentine tango and that was very fulfilling, but also very difficult. I thought it was more difficult than medical school because what we're really asking ourselves to do at midlife is we're a midlife woman and we've been told by society that we're no longer useful and we're no longer sexy and we're no longer whatever it is. And you, and you have to work with those beliefs and you have to say, that does not need to apply to me. It does not need to apply to me. I, I'm not going to be that woman. I'm going to become healthier, stronger. We have you know, data showing that women in their 60s and 70s are having the best sex of their lives. So, so the main thing about perimenopause is all of these mostly unconscious beliefs come up that you're not allowed, you're not allowed to get your needs met. Now you're allowed to make sure that your father's needs are met or your children's needs are met or your husband's needs are met, but you, not so much. And so that's a major obstacle to health. Once you overcome that, and it takes great courage, it takes great courage. Once you've overcome that, then all the little things you do for symptom relief, you know, exercise, decreasing the simple carbohydrates, the sugars, the alcohol, that kind of thing. Once you do that, you'll find that the hormones are far more balanced. The other thing I teach everybody, and, and here's an example, one of the things that creates anxiety, I had another patient, so much anxiety, so much anxiety. And I noticed that her breathing was just through the mouth, stress response, and only in the upper lobes of the lungs. You know, you know, you tell someone to take a deep breath and they go, no, 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 no. A deep breath has to start down in the lower lobes of the lungs, and you can only get there by breathing through your nose. So if you have anxiety, then a quick way to quell it is to take a deep breath in through the nose. So we can all do that together. Hold it a minute and then exhale. Now, if you take a deep breath in through your mouth, let's take a breath in through our mouth. Completely different it almost makes you have anxiety breathing in through your mouth. But if we breathe in through our nose, let's do that again. The air is going, and that let it out, the air is going right down through the diaphragm where the vagus nerve travels. So when you breathe deeply and the rib cage expands in the lower lobes of the lungs, you're engaging the parasympathetic rest and restore nervous system. And that begins to digest the stress hormone. It hormones, it changes your heart rate and you instantly get into calm. And isn't it interesting, no matter what part of medicine you're in or wherever you are, the breath is always one of the first things that we're told to attend to. I used to have little 3M stickies on the phone, on my computer, on my refrigerator that just said, breathe. <laughs> <laughs> because we tend to forget about breathing properly. 
Yeah, yeah, we do because we hold our breaths to not feel. We hold our breath so that we don't have, oh, if I could just get through this, you know? So we need to breathe, you know, five good deep breaths through your nose, out through your nose, really, really helps with a panic attack, an anxiety attack, uh, anything like that. So we're kind of bringing around how much taking care of your body is related to taking care of your mind. <laughs> so once you take care of your mind, then you can take care, take better care of your body too. So that, um, that's exactly right because you won't do it. Uh, let me give you an example. So I've been working recently on uh, better squats as exercise because it's so important for the pelvic floor. Well, when you first start and you've been sitting a long time like me, and you try to go down in your hips, it's not comfortable. So you have to figure out what to do with your mind. And when your mind is saying, I don't like this, this, this just doesn't feel good. Because if you can get over that little bit of mind chatter because it's uncomfortable, and, and exercise tends to do that. If you're asking your body to do a little more than you wanna do, if you're asking your body to do that, it's always gonna say, ah, no, no, I'm, I'm not doing that. So you have to have a place in your body where you give, you, you're asking it to do more. It's uncomfortable, but it's not hurting you, but it's uncomfortable. And you know that if you keep it up, this is where the will and discipline comes in. If you keep it up, you will develop more flexible muscles, less problems with the hips, because we all sit too much. We all sit too much. And then this is interesting. What are the hips symbolically, biosymbolically? The hips are about moving forward in life. How many women get to the point where one hip or the other hip doesn't work and then they need a hip replacement? I can tell you that if I had not started to learn Pilates when I went through perimenopause and really got in there and got those hips looser, which you can do with yoga, whatever, I would have a hip replacement by now. Everyone in my family sort of had a right hip thing, you know? <laughs> <I don't. laughs> yeah, and it's really common. And there's so many, it is such interesting topic that we are talking about. I just didn't even realize how time is passing. <laughs> so let me try to summarize a few points that you discussed. Number one was that we need to take care of our mind and have the courage to express ourselves so we are not carrying that stress hormone that affects uh, the symptoms too. The second thing you talked about is that there are simple tools that we can use. One was, uh, what did you say, Chillos? How do you yes, spell it? Can you spell it? Brand, it's a brand name and it's okay. C-H-I-L-L-O, Chillo. Right. So it's All a right. chilly right. pillow. <laughs> Wonderful. I just wanted people who are listening to be able to catch that. And uh, there were some herbs that you described that uh, we can use, knowing that uh, simple sugars and alcohol can actually make hot flashes worse. Yes. Did I miss anything? Nope, that's it. That's right. it. And the breathing. And then the breathing and through the, breathing. the nose. Yeah. So deep breathing exercises not only helps calm down your brain, but it also calms down your body and probably your hormones and help you create balance over there. And if needed, treatment is okay. You can get treatment. You don't have to suffer. And maybe it's the topic for next time that there are a lot of bioidentical hormones yeah. that are better than getting the commercial hormones. For the estrogen, you kind of share how, which form of the estrogen is the best form. Can you share that again? Yes, you want to have bio-identical estrogen. So let me give you some sources that you can get in any drugstore. And that would be the Vivel Dot and Plimera Patch, 17-beta uh, estradiol. So what's interesting is pharmaceutical companies cannot patent any naturally occurring substance. And therefore, what they've done to get around that, they're giving you hormones that are exactly like what your female body creates but they have patented the delivery system in, in the patch. So the ones to avoid are Premarin, made from the urine of pregnant horses, pregnant mares, urine, Premarin, and Provera, a synthetic progestin. But there are many, many, many types 
of bioidentical estrogens available on the market. So you just wanna read the label. Formulary pharmacies are across the United States that do a beautiful job of individualizing the dosage so that you can titrate it to a woman's own body. Yeah. The Prairie Marifica, and I have my own company with that. So it's called Amada Life. It works beautifully for many, many hot flashes. We have a vaginal gel that thickens the vaginal mucosa. Many women complain of dryness, but there are vaginal estrogens you can get at the regular drugstore, though the price has gone up dramatically. My sister got some and it was $380 and I was shocked. Oh so, God. you know, look at some of the alternatives. Right, right. Yeah, and, and uh, I would always recommend people to do these things in collaboration with your healthcare professionals Absolutely. and find an integrative provider if you can. But yeah, these a lot of these things you can do. And just kind of to wrap up the message, if you don't take steps for taking care of your mind and body as you go through the, this phase and say, oh, it is just the menopause, what kind of problems you can face in terms of, you know, you can lose the, we are living uh, longer. So we are living more, more life as an our menopause phase than reproductive phase. So that's we, correct. Yeah, that's yeah. right. So you want these to truly be golden years. Yes. And the only way they're going to be golden years is if you if you take steps and you use your will to do some things, because when you're 20, 32, whatever, you usually don't have to worry. Your body gives you all kinds of leeway, but by about the age of 40, the body goes, we're done. And then it's up to you. <laughs> yeah. So do you have any uh, last take home message for our audience today? Yes. And I would say this to all the women going through perimenopause, you don't need to suffer the best years of your life are all ahead. Do not believe the mainstream culture about this is the beginning of the end. It's the beginning of the beginning. <laughs> Thank you so much. And I would recommend all our audience to visit Dr. Northrup's website. It's www.drnortrup.com. And her uh, book, Wisdom of Menopause, is it like a fourth edition now? Or, yes. Uh, it's, yes. It's just coming out. And so check it out. It may, be, uh, it may have some pulls of wisdom that can help you. You can sign up for her free bi-weekly newsletter at her website. So please check it out. And as usual, all the resources that we share in these programs and uh, past recordings, you can find on happyandhealthymind.com. So now it's time for a special. So the special for today is for those times when you feel really overwhelmed. And uh, you know how when you are overwhelmed, you're not able to think straight, you're not able to focus, and especially you start losing passion in the things that you usually feel passionate about. You start kind of losing the joy. And so what to do in that situation? Would you like to learn a technique that I usually share that really helps people? Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, so I'm going to share a three-step formula that really helps in any kind of stressor when you feel you're feeling overwhelmed and it can help bring that joy and passion back in your life because that overwhelm of that stress is robbing you of being able to enjoy whatever you are doing. All right, so be able to apply i just want to use this example like you know i was also feeling really really overwhelmed a couple of months back when you know so many things were happening and there was so much demand on my time i i almost started feeling like you know i don't want to do this i don't want to do this and then i realized like you know these are the things that really give me passion this is my calling i really really want to do it why am i losing passion and so recognizing that i'm feeling overwhelmed that starts that can help you shift that stress because it's the perspective you have about whatever is happening around you so the three steps you want to follow is first calm down second process third respond so cpr's i call it mind cpr like body cpr so for first step 
as soon as you realize that you're feeling overwhelmed, you want to calm down using any calming technique. So Dr. Nathra just showed one of the techniques of deep breathing exercise. I have taught many different techniques that you can find on YouTube or internet where either you use the breathing, either you do the meditation, you do any of the exercises, art, music, dance, anything that calms you. So your brain that is constantly fixated on all the problems, it can get a little relief. Once it gets relief, then you can think through. So second step is process. Think through what is coming from outside that is not in your control and what you can do in response that is in your control because our mind keeps on focusing on things that are not in our control and makes us feel overwhelmed. So once you bring your thought to what is within your control, what you can do to respond, then the third step is to respond with intention, with wisdom. See what is the difference between response and reaction is the difference of the choice. You know, you feel something and you react and you later on you can regret about it. But you may re respond the same way if you do it with the choice, I choose to do it, then you feel empowered rather than victimized. And that way, whatever is overwhelming you loses the control on you. And then you are back in the driving seat and you can enjoy whatever you're doing and you can make that with the choice and you can do whatever you're doing with full passion and empowerment. All right, so three steps for calming down feeling of overwhelm is CPR, calm down, process and respond. And this is a mental health awareness month going on. So I leave you with the question, what gift are you giving to give yourself? So you can continue building the resilience live your best life with health and happiness. On that note, thank you so much, Dr. Razeem.